Um, but welcome everyone. I am Olivia. I have met, luckily I've met a good bunch of you a lot and work with you and actually know that um, several of you are much better at this than I, I am. Um, and that's why I love what I do is as what I do call myself, your research assistant. Um, it is fun for me to find the best ways to equip you to do the work um, that you have been called to do. Um, and this has definitely been one of the most interesting years to do that work. And yet um, we were the people in some ways who were more prepared for this than almost anybody else. Um, some of that I really think is because anybody under 30 or 35 is primarily visual anyone under that age is already tied to technology and their phone. And so we have been trying to figure out for at least 10 years how to create quality faith-based um, relationships in the virtual reality. Um, and now everyone else is starting to have to come along by force and we have some fun things to offer them as we go forward. Um, there are a couple different things. Um, if you know me, um, my brain just goes. Um, it likes to go, it goes different directions, um, but I ultimately wanna go the direction you need to go. Um, I value that this is your time. Um, and as your time, I need to know what you need so that I can not go in a bunch of different directions, but I can also spend some time with you um, just going in the directions that'll be most helpful to the ministries that you serve. Um, so for a second, are there anything like right now as we approach Advent, um, as we are in the middle of fall, as things start to spike, as clearly half your state is without electricity, um, I can't provide electricity, I'm not that good, um, but <laughs> what, what do you need? Um, are there anything specifically just to get started? Because that'll be the most helpful for me. I guess, you know, what are you hearing about other churches, you know, offering children's expressions of any kind and now one of the questions protocol. I have, Darlene, is does your church have a screen? Like a green screen? No, just like a oh. do you like project actual like words on are have have you updated to the projectors or the TVs or any of those kind of screens? In our adult sanctuary we do. In right. my children's worship space, no, not yeah. But well, yeah, Stuart would come get me. <laughs> but I am looking at the the space to do that as kind of a central gathering area in our children's area that does have a smart TV. But okay. I don't plan on using it. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot there to unpack. Yeah. And the first thing I really want to offer to you, Darlene, is a, um, a time after this meeting. Sure. Um, because that's what I love to do, to brainstorm yeah. um, what that looks like. I've, I've been learning. Um, one of the things that I love about what I do is, for those of you who don't know, I also um, serve as a part-time solo pastor in a small congregation of about 40 people. Um, so what's interesting is like where I can come forward with these great things that people tell me or that I research and all of these things, I then go to my own church and try to apply them. Um, and they are well aware that they are quality guinea pigs in a lot of these things. And, and they have been quality guinea pigs during the pandemic as well. Um, and they have embraced that. Um, but one of the things that we actually started a lot earlier that I spend a lot of my time talking about is we do, and Darlene knows this, we do worship and wonder in worship. So our children don't actually leave the worship service at any point. Um, but obviously we're in a pandemic. So when we first came back into the building, instead of actually bringing the children forward, we started showing the videos of the um, pre-recorded worship and wonder. And so that those who did not come into the sanctuary, those were also um, sent out. And I started to learn that I could also share via Zoom that recording so that the kids that were at home 
were experiencing the same thing that the people within the worship service were able to experience. Now, sometimes it's hit or miss with my technology. So I always had the book on standby to pause um, or mute it if I needed to, um, or some of the recordings are better than others, but especially with your skill set, you could even just record them and then read the stories as they can visually watch from a distance. We have started to come back up forward after we did orientation this fall, but we have each of the kids bring carpet squares with them so that they socially distance and wear their mask um, from that. Now we're not huge. So depending on your number of kids will kind of depend on what happens. But what's then been interesting is I've shared my screen virtually and we have a couple of families who feel safer at home but the kids are still responding in the chat with wondering questions. Um, now, one of them who's really good at this is a, another pastor's kid. So let's be honest that that's just a different breed in general, but they, they do respond via the chat on what is happening. Um, and then I have done drop off tools for the parables over the summer to give them things to work with at home and plan to do that with Advent. The other resource I wanna share with you um, is I know some of you um, went ahead and ordered the family Advent stories that we are doing this year. Um, they are based on worship and wonder ideas and concepts, but they're still a little bit different. Um, but you, there are felt pieces that come, but all of those stories are going to be available to print out. Um, so I will be able to share those with you in just a moment. So I will make a note to show you some of those stories um, as a way to help your families worship and engage in these at home. And we're actually going to use those stories for our Advent instead of the actual worship and wonder stories. Um, and they start with how the church tells time. They go through the four weeks of Advent. Um, but instead of Magi, we have Elizabeth. And then the Magi actually come during Epiphany. Um, if you have creative people who are good with felt, felt is my ministry downfall, I feel. But those who are good with felt, if you didn't pre-order um, from, from Worship Woodworks or from us, you can still do felt or you can even still do basic print-offs. Um, there are different ways to work, work cost effectively. Um, with these stories as you go through and it provides both at home and in worship experiences. And so even if your kids are still just sitting in the pews, you can totally print those off and give them something to think about and talk through as you're there. So those are some of the resources that we have as you head towards Advent. Um, a long time ago, early on in this job, I also put together Faith at Home Advent videos that are still available. Um, just to help kind of encourage people different ways to do Advent at home. You know, I mean, Darlene, you're great at this. So just keep it simple. There's also the reverse Advent options. I um, mean, we have a whole list on our webpage of other Advent ways of engaging with faith at home and with crafts. So um, those are just some places to get started. Um, ultimately, so many people have no idea how to do any faith at home that just providing just some resources to read, to light a candle, to look at things is really um, what I think is crucial at this point because people are still panicking about what's happening in the building, but it's really important to remind them that faith development happens best at home. And this is a huge opportunity to equip our families with that. Are there any other um, things that now have percolated in your brain as we spend this time together? If not, I can start sharing with you some of these resources as well. And also just a reminder, I mean, Darlene and Tara definitely know at this point. And Luke, I don't think I know you very well, but I think you show up daily on the people you might know section of my Facebook. <laughs> feed um, because it's a small disciple world. Um, but please reach out anytime you have these kind of questions and these kind of struggles. Um, this is the stuff I love to do because this is what I needed when I was in your position. And this is even what I need now 
when I serve as a solo pastor in a church. Okay, so I want to take a moment then and share with you some things. Um, I will also leave some more time, um, but here's my screen share. Now I have children and other things happening, so you never quite know what's going to show up on my um, screen <laughs> as we begin. Um, but first of all, I want to make sure that you saw that Michael put in the chat. Um, I'm going to hide meeting controls. The um, our, our website, please remember, I'm part-time working with other quality part-time people. This is not always totally up to date, but we do the best that we can. <laughs> um, but you can see this will give you kind of a list of what is happening. There are also um, other events that we have been really busy with. We also do have, I forgot to mention our Christmas mission project, um, Disciples Justice for Children um, allows you to write letters um, to those who are in some of the detention camps um, as a way to reach out. Also, if you're interested in reaching out, um, the prison ministry in Kentucky is also accepting letters for different people. So as you try to find ways um, to reach out this season, that's kind of what happens. I do want to invite all of you. We have a similar meeting like this um, at the beginning of every month um, where we just kind of brainstorm through what is working, what isn't working, what we may need, what we may not need. Um, and we've had some quality ones of those. Um, as you come back together, these are some other um, options that are here. But if you go up here, we usually divide. You can see that we have churches. Um, and different ways of church. So liturgical resources is what you're kind of going to want to look for. And I come to this page all the time going, I need to make it prettier, but there's just so much stuff here. Um, but you can see there's a whole list of Advent and Christmas um, options that have been happening and plays and musicals that continue um, activities for at home instead of Elf on the Shelf, Kindness Elves. Um, these are just different resources that are all here for you as well. If you look at the top, you can also see we also have a Pinterest page. Um, my colleague Lisa Engelkin is the best at keeping this updated. Um, but you can see that a lot of these are divided also if you look at it correctly, which right now, hold on. Home, thank you. You can... Yeah, not now. And not, oh, this is my Pinterest page. That's why I didn't like it. <laughs> it went back to other stuff because I have access. Um, but this will show you different categories usually if you go through it. And we've updated Lint and VBS and, you know, we pin things that make sense um, and kind of put them together as well. Other resources that are on here, trainings, volunteers, um, tough situations, especially as kids are struggling um, to talk through a lot of the things that are happening. One of the things I do want to just share with you that I have loved as a parent is a podcast called But Why? And it comes up a lot of times and deals with COVID-19 and what's happening around race and um, what's going on with the election. And then it still also does, do unicorns exist? Um, so it's something easy for my children to listen to, um, to help them understand kind of what's happening in the world in, in, a, in a correct way. So that's called, um, but why? But you can see all of these ongoing things that we continue to update. The families section has become really crucial um, day to day, if you're looking for activities and ways to engage at home, there are so many different resources and ways to do this. Um, Daily 365 was put together um, by youth pastors. Um, so this is also a really good one as well, just to help. Devotions, all of this is here. But this is also just over here, a simple way to remind you of scripture to find different videos, just to keep it simple within your families, um, to provide space for 
what is sacred as well. Um, one of the things that sometimes I know I continue to do when I get lost is I try to make sure in my in my home, in my church, are we creating sacred space? Are we creating sacred stories? Are we creating sacred meals, which for a seventh grade boy might be pizza? Um, are we creating sacred steps and sacred conversation? Um, and these are kind of the ways to keep guide, guiding myself of that you don't have to do everything at once. And these are the pieces that kind of put together what works. I also wanna share with you that if you look, you can subscribe for our mailing list and that way we will try to keep you up to date on when our meetings are and what's happening. But right now our YouTube channel um, has 31 children worship and wonder stories um, that have been recorded by many of our wonderful trainers like Darlene um, as well. And these are the monthly ministries across generations meetings that have been recorded. Um, we have had Linda Stotts, who is with the Generosity Project, which talks about giving as a family unit in an intergenerational way. And Bruce Barkhauer joined us on that. We've had Corey Seibel, who wrote Intergenerative Church. We've had Heather Santy Brown, who put together a refugee and immigration virtual a mission trip that is also intergenerational. And we had Jennifer McLaughlin and Courtney Wooten, um, who talked about community, unity being all capitalized, Vacation Bible School that they put together a long time ago as well. And Lisa um, Engelkin is going to be talking during our first Monday meeting to talk about the best ways to go through the Advent stories and to use them. Um, so these, these are some quality videos that are here and here as well. Um, and then older things, but here you can see the Advent for Family playlist that I put together so many years ago, but it's still very relevant of just ways for families in one minute to think about engaging in Advent at home. Um, and then there's just kind of a list of different videos that are all here or quality places to look um, to kind of help out with that as well. So I wanna make sure that you are aware of what is here um, to help resource your ministry. You know, it's that weird communication age where nobody communicates the same way. And once you do, if you ever friend me on Facebook, Darlene and Tara can tell you, I will um, consistently harass you if you're online with what's coming and what's happening. Because if you're like me, there's so many things happening and it's so overwhelming um, and trying to figure out the best way to create space. And yet sometimes the best suggestion is just stop everything and take a moment to remember God is there. But so many people just don't have that, that way of thinking anymore. We, we've lost that. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the things that are also on there, obviously Tara is part of Gen On. Um, and Logos Ministry, and I totally didn't mention Liz was with us in August. I knew I was forgetting somebody. That was the worst. So Liz Perot, who's the head of Gen On, was our August meeting, um, and she has been meeting with a lot of different trainers, but so much about what they do is around the table, and really, we're just providing different opportunities of thinking of what the table looks like in both the home and then connecting it back, and so um, Gen On is another amazing resource and a lot of their studies um, inform a lot of my work along with a lot of what um, 21st century faith formation puts together. So you have a couple different players who are in constant conversation with each other through these things. Um, my plug always if, that I still plug is the Intergenerate book. If you haven't gotten this, um, this is one of my favorites and Corey's new book, um, is also really good intergenerative church, which I don't have at the moment, but I'm getting it. Generations Together is still a classic, as well as Growing With. And these literally sit on my desk. So <laughs> I have so many books around this office, but th those are some of the ones. And as you um, examine Generation um, Z, as they kind of continue to come into adulthood, um, there's a really good book that Lee Yates actually helped co-author um, about Gen Z and what they look like. And they're now the young adults. Um, so that's important. But then there's gonna be this huge switch now that COVID-19 is going to be the primary thing that really shapes the whole next generation. 
Um, and so as people who work with younger people, we need to start naming that awareness as well. One of the videos that is on, um, that is on the page is this um, on our website. And so, oh, hi, Andrew, welcome. Um, but these, this is put together to actually help create conversation. Um, I will tell you that one of the biggest things, oh, oops, that is not what I wanted. Where did it go? Hold on. Um, one of my largest struggles um, as I have come into this ministry is um, I will tell you that I don't believe in associate pastors. Um, I don't, I don't believe in, um, sorry, in um, senior pastors, which sounds really strange. Um, but I feel like one of the major things that um, a lot of us have talked about is some of the things that have primarily um, hurt the church the most is the programmatic images around church. Um, not that programs are a bad thing, it's just that the pendulum went so far to that side of age segregation that we segregated our churches to a point where people left and they never came back. And research continues to show us that. Um, so those of you who serve in those roles, um, I continue to struggle with some of the things that are said around those roles. Um, especially things like it's a stepping stone or it's um, always paid less when you are working with the most vulnerable. Um, I personally believe who can ever figure out how to work best with seventh grade boys should be paid the most in the church. Um, and I've always believed that because if you can, you can deal with seventh grade boys and have them have a faith experience, then you deserve all the money you can. I think it's a spiritual gift that should have been listed with Paul. Um, but so we put together some of these as a resource to help people have conversation about things they haven't thought about. If you were at General Assembly in 2019, we started handing out cards. I'd go around and say, pick a card, any card, and then I would joke with people and they'd go wah wah, um, that it's not magic, it's ministry. Um, and so the cards were divided out um, and people would say, now what do we do? And I'm like, figure out how to put the cards back together because we currently live in a church that is separated out, um, that we are not actually back together. And it is really in many ways a reconciliation issue. And I can even see it as we talk about racism and sexism and the intersectionality of all of those things that sometimes when we're talking about these things, there are only two or three generations in a room. And while two or three generations is still an intergenerational experience, um, it's limiting kind of some of the visions and understanding that we really need to do better healing. Um, so that is why, as I've worked in this job, it has moved to be called Ministries Across Generations. Um, a lot of times then people will give me pushback that I don't care about children, even though that's what I was hired to do. Um, but ultimately, I care that children and youth and young adults remain faithful as adults and for life. Um, my success that I have learned is not how many youth are in your youth group, but how many 26 year olds who were in that youth group are still journeying in a faithful way. Um, and so really talking through what creates um, a faithful reaction. So I created this PowerPoint and it has different quotes from the cards that we had. And these quotes then can be paused and slowed down, but asking the question of how do you define these terms, which can bring wholeness, intergenerational, multi-generational, cross-generational. Those are three very different terms and yet sometimes they're used as synonyms um, one of the reasons we were not an intergenerational ministry specifically, even though obviously a lot of times that sounds like what we are, is for many adults, intergenerational means bringing kids into the room, but not intentionally including them. Um, and that was the impression given by many of the young people. 
um, where other people also see intergenerational as only focused on children, which doesn't seem to make sense to me, but is where we're at. Um, so this is some of the conversation about how are you doing intergenerational ministry? And it's become even more crucial during COVID-19 because many of our families are obviously intergenerational. And at some point I heard a statistic that 30% of all families live with their grandparents or others and that a family unit doesn't actually look like just two generations. It's obviously three or four generations in many different families or just two very separated generations, um, especially as people are taking care of um, grandkids, and trying to figure out how to balance this. So the fact of being able to talk across generational lines um, is even more crucial within the home at this point as well um, and understanding how those generations work. Um, my favorite part of this has become the Gospel of John. Um, often Jesus says, feed my lambs first. And while people will feed the sheep first, I often joke that, no, the first response is to feed the younger ones. And that then interconnects because if you're practicing the best ways to feed those who are younger, then you're equipping the adults on how to do that. Um, but these continue to ask that question. Corey, who was one of our speakers recently, um, one of his quotes is, I will argue the process of change for multi-generational churches that desire to become purposefully intergenerational is like being called to a place we do not yet know. Um, that continues to be one of the most powerful um, quotes to me. Um, but most people, when they start to talk about their faith life, they love to share who are the adults um, in their lives, who were the grandparents, who were the ones who really were the ones who led them to faith. And they can easily talk about this, but many of our children and younger people can't. Um, one of the reasons that camp um, is so important isn't because of just peer relationships, but ultimately because of the adult relationships that helped then guide those youth into young adulthood and then adulthood. Um, and so that's part of this. Um, Jason Santos, who is another scholar of this, um, talks about how many of us are to blame um, by not cultivating quality relationships um, across generational lines. It's very easy to live into the, I'm the children's pastor, I'm the senior pastor, I'm a solo pastor. We, we have segregated even the images of our leadership. Um, so this, these are some questions of, do you believe we have failed our young people to ask? How do we grieve those who have left the church community? Um, what does it mean to cultivate? Um, does it mean the latest curricula? Because obviously that's the question I get asked the most is what's the curriculum that's going to fix all of our problems? Um, but they don't like the answer because a lot of times worship and wonder for adults is probably my best answer. Um, but adults don't want to sit still and actually go through that process. So we're learning. Um, I, <laughs> Akila is also, she is um, connected to several different groups that do leadership and um, cultivate thinking. But one of the questions is, do we hire out our ministries with young people? Um, and then what happens beyond Sunday? Um, and talking about the ministry and, and church is about living life together. Um, so that's something is powerful. I'm going to continue to go through these. These are all online. Um, but these are questions that um, as you are engaging in a time of change and shifting or as you're reaching out to really think about um, so that it's not a it's about creating intentional ways to figure out how to communicate with each other and create a relationship that lasts. Um, what are the issues around having children in worship, Darlene? Um, what are the issues around having adults in worship? And I will tell you my struggle with um, some of these is that if you don't have the person in the pulpit responding to these issues, if, it, if it's just somebody who is supposed to respond on the sidelines, then you will not be able to engage multiple ages in worship well. Um, because the person in the pulpit is truly the one who has to understand faithfully while we are all welcome 
um, and be able to use the pulpit as a way to help educate and move the church to a better place with that. Um, this is a great one of giving seniors a graduation Bible and hoping for the best just isn't cutting it. Roughly 50% of students walk away from the church after they graduate high school. Um, thus, when seeing things like this, um, it breaks my heart because obviously I believe that having a faith life um, helps us walk through life much more intentionally. So how do you prepare people to find a new faith home? I'm Sarah Nay Fisher, who is a pastor in Texas, who writes some really great blogs, who's a disciple, um, does a really good job of how we don't actually teach our young people how to know what to look for when they move to a new place or how to kind of look at the bulletin or look at the space or look at what's on the wall. So they'll go with their friends because that's what they're comfortable with, but that not may not actually match who they have grown into being. We continue through talking about how, um, how we should flip the ratio. What happens if you have five adults for every one kid on a retreat versus one adult for every five kids? Um, and why is that relationship? And I think that's a powerful question. Uh, we try to hire out one or two adults, but are we really equipping the church as a whole to be in relationship um, with one another? Um, and sometimes we are not. Mark DeVries, um, who is the lead of Ministry Architects, who has been at, active with disciples, also provides a quality quote. Um, and to remind us that younger people mentor you. I love that I've had several colleagues lately who posted, who are your young mentors? Who are the people under 30 who are mentoring those who are older? That we often need to continue to flip the images that go with these things. If you haven't read Kenda Dean's Almost Christian, even though it is older, it is still um, one of the best resources that based on Christian Smith and his work and, and study, um, but to talk through milestones. And the fact that one of the things is while we focus a lot of times on milestones with children and younger people, we don't actually give milestones to adults in a way that help them really see that they are growing in their faith. We just assume they are without really checking back in. And because of those assumptions, a lot of times they're really fearful to come forward and say, I have no idea who Peter is. Um, and maybe I, I know I'm supposed to, but I don't. And we don't have crossover. Um, I know that we have a lot of people who say, I've served my time. Um, in the church. So I'd like that question of going, what does that mean um, as far as the church being relationship? Um, as we look more at home, maintaining that at home, what does each age group contribute um, is an important question. Um, the higher out question is obviously on here twice. I finally just noticed that. <laughs> How does our society hurt our relationships? Um, I think it's important to say that um, programmatic um, advertising works and thus in some ways our church has lived into our societal um, culture much more so than our faith culture when it comes to these things. Um, looking at worship in different ways of approaching it as both the time to teach and experience and practice and engaging in pointing that intentionality out. And Liz Perot, yay, she made it, go Tara. Um, celebrating the moments of your faith community um, with one another and talking about how that deepens. And then of course I put Paul, um, which is the body of Christ. But um, so there are a lot of quotes. There are a lot of things that are on here. I am going through this obviously very, very quickly. Um, but some of that is because this is the place, a lot of times when people start asking me questions, um, this is the place to start about, you know, what does this really look like? How are we creating church and people and faith in a way that allows them to have um, relationship for life? Um, and these are the better questions than just going, well, who do we hire because we need people in our pews? And Darlene, it sounds like right now you're getting those questions and the questions don't actually come, they come from a place of fear 
much more than a place of um, faith. And, and we understand that. That's what happens. We in that place of fear is not necessarily a bad thing. That place of fear is comes from a good place, a place of concern. Um, but is naming that is important. So are there any thoughts, reflections, questions? That's a lot. Um, but I have only a short time with you and I want to give you as much as I can to help you because it's such a critical time um, for these types of questions in this way of thinking. So Olivia, are you um, are you describing the church you grew up in? I think I'm describing a lot of different churches as things go through. Um, and the reality that I'm not old enough where I've seen a lot of my friends who grew up in the church. But um, one of the things I always joke is I got in trouble, imagine, um, my senior year at camp for hanging out too much with the adults. And the other people who got in trouble are all still in the church. So, you know, Wilson, John, like we're all still active in the church because we had those adults where all the ones who were the cool kids hanging out with the other kids aren't still in the church. I mean, they're kind of connected in and out, but they didn't have strong enough like relationships to keep them really connected and what they knew was very different um, and I'm a zenial so I fall half Xer half millennial and it depends on the day and my mood um, but I also grew up I had a very different experience because my dad was 60 when I was born so I didn't grow up with the same generational parents and while I knew that as a kid um, its influence and its reality has become much more pronounced and profound as um, I've served in the church of what that really meant because I had a very different experience with different generations. Um, and I can see how I actually ended up with the better experience um, because I had the older people who knew how to talk about faith at home and knew how to talk about church at home in my daily life. Well, you know, this is just so exciting to me because when I was in seminary, all I wanted to do was relational church and, and intergenerational kinds of things. And everywhere I was, you know, that everybody was pushing me, saying, no, 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 we want this. We want you to be a youth pastor, a children's minister. And, and uh, I finally gave up and started preaching. <laughs> in the in the uh, 90s and uh, so this is really exciting to hear you talk about all this and uh, I think that uh, gives me a whole lot of uh, energy to renew for for these kinds of things uh, I too have seen so many young people that boy they have such a great time uh, th through youth missions and and all the things, and then and then I kind of only see them when it's time for weddings and to baptize their kids, and and so I'm I'm so longing for those relationships to to become strengthened, and 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 so I I need help as a pastor. How do you get started working on that? I mean, um, you know, it seems like it's been it's been so heavily pastor oriented that the pastor is the one who kind of keeps them all together, and that's I know that's not the best way. That's where the pulpit does have power. Is is what you're you know it you've got and and it takes time but you've got to take those moments with your people and remind them and now they're now they're being forced to be reminded that you're in your house and sometimes you're not able to come into this building but that doesn't mean that God's not there and that doesn't mean that worship doesn't happen and that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to be in community 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons that I love the at-home tools um, or, or those kids who do only come back for bad tisms and things of going, oh, look, everybody, now that we have some virtual, maybe you'll respond or I can send you the link or I can add you to this. And it's literally just the little touches um, and, and the little, little insights that I know as a parent, that's all I can chew. One of the things our folks have been uh, doing, what, what I've been doing uh, is inviting the kids to be a part of that connecting to the congregation. Uh, just for instance, like on Mother's Day, when we weren't in worship, um, we uh, prepared little rose pins uh, that had a, a beautiful card that went with them. And uh, on, on Mother's Day morning, we got together about, there were about five different uh, families with their kids and we delivered these Mother's Day pins to every woman in the congregation to their front door. And, uh, and most of the time, you know, it was, was knocking and waving from, from down on the sidewalk, but, but everybody, you know, received that energy from, from having been touched by all those kids. It was, it was so powerful for our congregation. Um, it, it it's real, literally saw us through a really tough time. Um, and, uh, and those kids, they're, boy, they've got a lot of energy to do that kind of thing. Um, now, now the tough time thing is to, to um, invite our adults to, to be that kind of reaching out and do those kinds of things. Uh, at the start of school, we prepared uh, back to school kits for all the, all the kids and the, and the, the, the adults uh, uh, assembled all the stuff and, and then we delivered those to the, all the families with children. But uh, it's, it's work. And in some ways, having the virtual space has allowed me to connect more with my church because it's not getting in the car and traveling and taking up that extra time. So there, there are ways in where there are still those that that's not the space that they're comfortable in living in as a lot of more people learn. It also allows a little bit more of those engagement opportunities. I've been... Um texting with our worship chair and our interim minister, we have a in-person 9 a.m. worship, but it's kind of like what Darlene says, you know, you're coming in and the kids are sitting there during, I just said, we need to be a little bit more intergenerational during the worship, maybe have like what you're doing, a young, uh, young children in worship moment. And so, because there are a few kids who come and poor things, it's 9 a.m., so they're half asleep, and they, I know, I'm just going, okay, get a little pillow, lay down, and we'll be done in a few minutes, but we need to incorporate, if we're only having one, we need to incorporate something so the kids feel a part of the worship, too, instead of just sitting there and listening to a lot of liturgy. Well, and let me tell you some fun backwards ways of that is um, right. coloring sheet will not make it intergenerational. No. Nope. Now, while nope. I love myself, but it will if you give it to the adults. Let me tell you, my church has started to make sure, like my, my church secretary, not really even a secretary, but we started putting out adult coloring baskets because a lot of my adults like to color to listen and like to do things. Now I have the one lady in church who goes, my mother would roll over in her grave if I colored. Okay, don't. But even now she has made sure once we started printing bulletins again, even though that's not safe and nobody asked me, once we did. No, that's a problem too. <laughs> they didn't ask. But in the, in the coloring baskets are gone during COVID, but yeah. they don't have coloring sheets so that they can color the adults miss the coloring not yeah. the kids the adults yeah because there and there's so many quality ways of um 
engaging and saying, you know, that's where the senses come in and the reality that we don't all learn in the same way. And some of us do need to fidget and some of us do need to color. Um, usually if I look like I'm paying attention is when I'm not. That is when I have zoned. But if I'm coloring or if I'm doodling or if I'm doing something active, I am much more engaged um, in what is actually like in being able to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's different, you know, and some people are visual and reminding people that 30 and under are visual people. So if you're not providing visual ways of worship and you're mm -hmm. all verbal, then yeah. that's also going. And then there are people who are musical. Well, that holds a whole new COVID interest. But if you're yeah. sitting out at home options to worship, then you can include music and, and liturgy around that. Um, an intentional means also having the person from the pulpit realize that somebody might have to give something up. And that does require that grieving process and there's so much grieving already. Um, yeah. A lot of times if you are handing out coloring sheets or if you are handing out something for kids to doodle and do, I do that before the sermon. Right. Because my assumption is really most of worship is for the children anyway. They can pray, they can add yeah. in the announcements, they can participate in the table. Like they have acted, they can read, they can yeah. do all of those things. But sometimes, yeah, the sermon is hard. Um, and so this provides them that. But let me also tell you, here's what happens. So I will go into a church and be like, we should do worship and wonder in the sanctuary in church. Uh -huh. And they will all throw a fit that children cannot sit still during worship but so what happens is so we go through worship and wonder the adults cannot sit still they hate sitting still during the story and i have given them the hardest time of going well if you can't sit still in the pew we have chairs up here that you can come listen <laughs> and we still have the videos and we have the other things and the pushback always gets that I don't know how the children sit still we're so bored can you entertain us during the story and and that sometimes we're putting our energy in the wrong places and I think COVID actually is allowing us to put our energy in possibly better places if we take that opportunity yeah um I use and it's not, I always have to, they're a little too conservative, but their games have been really good and helped me be more creative, download youth ministry for screen games and different ideas for COVID times. Uh, and it's actionforhappiness.org. And so this at the beginning of the uh, shelter at, at home, I printed this coping calendar. It's keep calm, stay wise, be kind, and it has ideas for every day of the month. But they have uh, also, if you go to their website, you can click on the calendar link and they have one that's specifically geared towards families, but they've done a different one every month too. And they're just positive um, activities to occupy your mind, body, soul, all that together. Um, so that's been really helpful to me and my mom, who's um, pretty much still only comes to our house or her apartment um, and feeling really isolated. So that's what action I for happiness. Actionforhappiness.org, right? Yes, yes, Perfect. you, you got, got it. it correct there. Okay, I'm gonna share mine. Here's a picture in front of you. And what we've done a lot this summer is to have a garden and share with that. And that gave me resources to go and share with families because they weren't coming to church as much. And I had, as a diabetic, I have to be real careful about not being around them in very close quarters. So um, having something to share and something to go on gives you that relationship that she kept talking about that is slow to develop, but if you have the time to do it, 
and you're there when they can talk about what's stressing them, I'm finding that's really helping. And we've had to do some funerals and and things like that. Nothing COVID related, but life goes on and people need to be ministered to. So, so I would encourage you to find something simple, whether you can do it with your youth group or somebody else, that is a way to give away of yourself and share. I wanted to share just a few thoughts because obviously good odds are we're going back into lockdown as we go through. Um, but some fun ideas that I have done just because I'm me is for Lent two years ago, I created a Facebook page for all of my old youth who were now young adults. Not all of them, but I picked about 20 of them to go, where are you now? Are you still faithful? And to ask like some of the weird questions of like that you want to go, why aren't you still in the church? What did, what would have been like, or are you still faithful even if you're not in the building? Cause I'm not totally attached to the church image either. Um, but kids that I had had just over time that I'd been really close to, but that, you know, we'd lost touch with. Um, so while you're at home, um, think about some of those people to reach out to as well. Um, I've also done like, um, granted younger kids aren't on Facebook, they're more on TikTok or Instagram, but um, done just like a daily uplift of different people. So I had about 40 youth at one of the churches I served and for the 40 days of Lent, I celebrated each one of them virtually and then allowed others to lift them up and to say positive things about them, almost like just different messages. So think of some just creative, whether emails or things like that to lift people up, but also have a time limit. Um, people my generation and younger don't like having things that don't have a time limit. The moment you say this might last forever is the moment we're like, we're out, <laughs> we're never into. But that's what's great about the liturgical holidays. So as you enter into Advent and you're like, okay, we got 25 days or, the 12 days of Christmas or, or use those liturgical holidays to put a little bit of energy in some of those places because then you don't feel like you're seeping energy. Um, but just think about ways to uplift each other during that because we are heading to that. And I had that thought. Go ahead. Not necessarily a, a resource to share, just kind of uh, family-wise what we've been doing um, during the pandemic is watching bedtime Bible stories with the skit guys. My boys still love doing that. They're on season two. So I think they've watched probably a hundred episodes now of, of that. And that's been um, a great talking point as a dad and, and um, with our new um, uh, um, foster that we have, that's really been a blessing to see him connect um, and grow in his faith through that. Um, and then as a church, um, while it was warm, just doing it really was helpful for families to do a kind of a, um, a stations VBS a couple times where we were able to just have their family unit go to different stations around town to um, connect with um, whether it was a, an obstacle course or a craft. Um, we just put up a giant cross in our town, so doing the lesson underneath that. So um, families really love that we provided that resource for them to connect something fun with something faithful. Our thanks to Olivia and all who participated in this adult swim. Be a blessing, disciples.